morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to the live program number 167 at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Venkat Ganpati from Tucson, Arizona. Dr. Ganpati is a sixth year into academic spine practice and currently is attached as associate professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Arizona, Tucson. He serves as chief of spine surgery and co-director of spine fellowship at the University of Arizona. He's also the faculty for air spine in North America. He's double board certified with American and Canadian boards, and he's also Canadian board certified for family medicine. Dr. Ganpati completed his orthopedic surgery residency at the Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. He again is double fellowship trained in complex spine surgery at the University of Toronto and the University of Western Ontario, Canada. His subspecialty interest is in adolescent and adult spinal deformity with an emphasis on minimally invasive techniques and his research interests are in spinal biomechanics, degenerative and spinal deformity. He is associate editor for CME in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery and is also the peer reviewer for the journal Spine, Spine Journal, the World Neurosurgery Journal, the JBJS and the Journal of Neurosurgery Spine. Today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Venkat Kempati from Tucson, Arizona. Over to you, Venkat. Thank you, Hitesh. Thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Um, so without um, any further delay, let's just jump into the talk. So the, the topic that I've chosen is um, Stoop to Conquer, essentially the principles of management of ankylosing spondylitis. So let me start with the case. Um, well, so the objectives are basic understanding of ankylosing spondylitis, um, principles of emergency management and uh, treatment options. But what we're not gonna cover today uh, for, for sake of time is uh, management of deformity, like osteotomy, et cetera, because that by itself is a separate talk. I don't have any disclosures. So let's start with this case. So this gentleman uh, fell downstairs, uh, landing on his back at his, at his own home. Before he was transferred, he's been having a history of uh, uh, an admission to the community hospital for a history of a diagnosis of a L2 compression fracture, at least based on the records that was uh, sent to us. Pre-fall, um, he had some minimal unsteady, uh, sorry, he was minimally unsteady uh, requiring uh, a walker, but he had no fine motor abnormalities, sensory or autonomic symptoms. He was admitted to the rehab center after the initial admission to the uh, community hospital. Um, his complaints continued to be mainly back pain and he was uh, having difficulty getting up uh, from bed. Uh, because of weakness in his legs, apparently. Um, they had initial x-rays and repeated subsequent x-rays, um, which showed some collapse of the fracture at that site. And therefore, he was sent for further management to our center. So these are the initial x-rays at the time of the admission to the community hospital. And um, um, I hope you can all see my, my cursor move. As you can, as you can imagine, there's uh, a fracture that's uh, obvious. Um, which is five, four, three, and between L2 and L3 here. Um, as you know, this is the, the picture on the right side is your uh, lateral x-ray and the one to the left is the AP x-ray. Um, and uh, the other thing that's obvious is the fact that the alignment, uh, if you follow the alignment is, is broken anteriorly and posteriorly. And there's also translation of L2 on L3, um, giving the uh, impression this could be unstable. Now these are the subsequent x-rays um, and you, you can see there's a little bit more of a fracture collapse uh, with the end plate uh, abnormality. Um, and it, you know, the, the alignment hasn't changed significantly but there's definitely a, a change in the, in, the, in the fracture. Now these are um, the uh, sagittal and the coronal CT but uh, let me just get to the uh, sagittal CT which is probably the most important here. As you can see, as I scroll through anteriorly there's a break in the anterior longitudinal ligament um, and there's a um, abnormality through the disc space. Uh, and posteriorly, as you see, there's exiting uh, fracture. And then if you follow it through the pars, you can see a fracture through the pars on one side and the other, right there. And then if you go to the uh, coronals, you can see the same thing, but it's not gonna be as useful. It's just for sake of demonstration. Okay, so the physical exam for this patient, the pertinent positives are, uh, at the time he came to the hospital, he was non-ambulatory because uh, you know, he was having difficulty getting up and walking. Um, and so we don't have any gait info. Um, he needed almost four pillows to, to support his head and his shoulders to keep him comfortable. Uh, he had some midline tenderness right over the fracture site. 
Um, he had some chronic right foot weakness, um, but he didn't have any sensory deficits and uh, particularly no upper motor neuron findings. If I am fast, please uh, slow me down or let me know so I can slow down a little bit. Um, so in, in, in the admission, um, he underwent um, advanced imaging with an MRI, which um, yeah, I'll get to the, the most pertinent slide right here. You can see a fluid sign. You know, let me just pause this, hang on one second. So here um, you have the vertebral bodies. This is a um, sagittal picture. You have vertebral bodies um, and then you have discs in between and you see a fluid sign right below the disc. Axial is not very helpful, but the most important part of the axial here I'd like to show you is that the patient did not have, this is at the fracture site. Um, he did not have any epidural hematoma. Not that we would expect this this far out, um, but it's important to understand that as part of your um, management, uh, because that would need to be taken into consideration um, when you treat them. So radiological and clinical diagnosis here, um, no surprise, it's, uh, and there's no, um, um, hidden agenda here, you know, we know it's ankylosing spondylitis because of the, um, the ankylosing type of a picture that we saw on the, um, see on the x-rays, but it's important to differentiate this from other differential diagnosis. We'll get to that in a few minutes. This patient also has pseudoarthrosis. Um, and just to put things in perspective, it used to be called spondylodiscitis, um, ankylosing spondylitis, because they thought it was, a, it was an infection. It turns out that it wasn't really an infection. It was a pseudoarthrosis or a non-union. And this patient also has an unstable three-column fracture. So in terms of decision-making, um, you know, the, one of the most popular um, classification systems we use um, uh, nationally and internationally is a TLIX classification system. Unfortunately, TLIX does not take into account special circumstances like ankylosing spondylitis. So it doesn't quite pertain, but the principles will still uh, remain the same. So in terms of management here, there are several options. Um, and I'll cut to the chase. Our choice here was uh, a percutaneous uh, posterior segmental fixation patient did not have any uh, hematoma. There was a burst component, but it wasn't causing um, any fecal um, tenting at that level. Um, and he didn't have any neurological deficits that were new. Again, uh, as just a reminder, he had a chronic uh, foot weakness, which, which predated this injury. So the indications here were instability and persistent back pain and difficulty getting up from, uh, from, a, from a sitting position, which was difficult to understand why, because as you can see, uh, as you saw in the MRI, there was no hematoma, there was no reason for him to have um, um, uh, a, a neurological deficit that was new. Um, it's possible that this could have been because of um, um, lack of effort and, and deconditioning over time because he was uh, in rehab, not moving. And so this procedure, we went from T12 to L5 um, percutaneously and uh, our EBL estimated blood loss was about 100. We didn't have any complications intraoperatively or postoperatively. So just to go over some of the quick steps here, now, this was a little while ago, and, and, and the reason why I put this case on was this can be done with x-ray, um, and this can also be done now with navigation. I, since I routinely use navigation, um, I don't do the x-rays anymore, and I only bring in x-ray for final pictures after we've done the case um, so that I can demonstrate, have a baseline before the patient gets transferred out. Uh, but this is uh, done with x-ray, so uh, forgive me and bear with me. I'll just go over the principles with x-ray management, and then uh, navigation makes it you know, that much easier, and we'll talk about some principles. So positioning this patient was prone. The advantage of doing it in this position, um, especially with a Jackson 4 post, um, is, is the fact that you can, you can reduce that fracture if you need to um, based on how you position the patient. So there are some patients who have a almost a chin on the chest deformity, um, and you can use this opportunity with the fracture to actually give them um, give them a better alignment, and then uh, um, and then fix them in that position. Now you're not trying to reduce them, but you can use the the, the table to your advantage um, because there's can be risks of neurological injury. And routinely we use uh, neuromonitoring. You know, I get baselines before we transfer the patient from a supine to a prone position, and we repeat the baselines again once they're on prone position to make sure there, there'll be no changes. Um, in, in, in this case, as you see, the, the arms are on an arm board. I don't use the arm boards now. I, we tuck the arms by the side. Uh, partly it's for logistics because when we bring the O-arm in, which is, uh, a, um, as the name suggests, it's a big navigation equipment, which kind of closes over on top of the patient, and you need to be able to slide it up and down depending on you know, where you want to get those pictures. And the arms get, get in the way, and obviously we don't want any iatrogenic injury, so we tuck the arm by the side. Um, 
And then depending on, so my cutoff is if, if, if there's a fracture above T7, um, I usually tuck the arms if I'm using x-ray. Uh, if it's below T7, it's possible to leave them uh, on the arm boards. So in terms of a stepwise approach, uh, this is again, mind you, using x-ray. So, you know, we use a needle called jam sheety. We um, essentially dock it as the picture on, your, on um, the left shows right here. You dock the jam sheety needle at the junction of the facet and the transverse process. And with the help of AP and lateral x-ray and you use biplanar fluoro, um, essentially having an AP x-ray and, and a lateral x-ray, this makes it much, that much easier and faster. Of course, there's, you, it's radiation every step of the way as you go back and forth. But the, the idea is to advance that needle um, into, the, um, into the pedicle and into the vertebral body uh, without breaching the, the medial wall of the pedicle into the canal. Um, and these are the steps as you follow them. Now, once you've done the, uh, um, once you've accessed the pedicle, and that's how it looks on the, um, on the, on the intraoperative views, then you essentially exchange that jam sheet to a K-wire. Once you exchange the jam sheet to the K-wire, then um, you take your pictures to confirm that your K-wire is in proper um, location and additional K-wires are placed depending on how many levels you're doing. And then subsequent to this, you, you're sequentially dilating it in order to create that space before you tap it. Um, because tap will, will wrap the muscles and the tissues, um, you know, causing postoperative pain and, and bleeding. Um, so this, um, the, the dilatation helps reduce that. And once you tap it and you remove the tap, you have to have uh, control of the guide wire the whole time. Otherwise, you'll, you'll, you'll end up pulling the guide wire out um, and it'll just add just that much more time to your surgery. So once you've uh, done that, then you do the extender assembly, which looks like that intraoperatively uh, onto the left end and to the right side after we put it all through. And then subsequent to this, um, essentially now you've created a, 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 um, a railroad and then you're, you're passing with a separate stab incision above, um, you're pushing the rod, as you see on the picture, the top left, um, in through that um, railroad, if you will. And then um, at the end, um, you make sure that you, your rod entry is confirmed. Of course, you use x-ray as well to confirm it radiologically to make sure that uh, the rods have not gone out. I mean, it's easier to push it out um, if you're not careful. And putting the number of levels you're doing, um, that it makes that much more difficult. Sometimes if you're skipping a level and, and it's happened to me before, you may have to make a separate stab incision between. So for example, if you're doing, uh, if you're skipping um, you know, T12 and L1 uh, with a long construct, uh, passing the bot can be difficult. So just as a practical tip, you can make a small stab incision, either one or two, um, to, to find that rod as it comes through to get to the distal segment. And that's how the rod looks um, after you've passed it. And then finally, you, um, um, you close the skin. So I put the slide up uh, because even though this was not the, the case, um, this is how the O-arm looks. Um, so we drape the, there's different ways of draping. Uh, we prefer to drape the patient and not the, the O-arm because it makes it a little bit more laborious and this is more, uh, and, and, and adds more time. Um, and the whole procedure now, um, since we started, it's now to almost 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so it doesn't add much to the, to the case and we don't have to wear lead. Um, it makes it that much more easier and it's less radiation overall. Um, and um, it makes it that much more enjoyable to be in the operating room and work without heavy lead on your back. And so with the arm, once you've taken a spin, uh, you're essentially creating a three-dimensional model. Um, I only use two, um, I mean, you can use multiple um, different views if you want, but I only use the axial and the sagittal. Um, and then you, you're essentially finding the, before you even make an incision, where, where there's a, um, I, I call it chicken foot. It's like a, it's like a navigation um, um, equipment, which essentially helps you find the entry point. And then you can uh, make a small stab incision over on top of it. Um, and you're doing the same steps. Uh, but this, you're using navigation, as you can see on the left side here. Um, these will allow you to, um, uh, essentially, the, the, so this is a triangulation. So the arm, which is around this person, has a camera. And then you have this um, stealth station, which is, it also has a camera. And then both those talks to the instrumentation. And that's how you triangulate it and, you're, uh, and are able to uh, get the entry point and the uh, access to the pedicle. So the final product from our case looks like this. So we went three above and three below. Uh, and we can talk about the evidence for that as well. And this was our, our patient postoperatively. 
So just a, an introduction to ankylosing spondylitis. So it's an inflammatory spondylar arthropathy, as we all know. Um, it affects the spine. Um, essentially, um, SI joints are, are mainly affected, which is how you differentiate this from uh, one of the differential diagnoses, which is DISH, or diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. Um, it can cause conjunctivitis and uveitis, which can be a, an emergency. Um, there is an association with HLA-B27, um, but only 5% of patients with a positive HLA-B27 develop ang So it's not a very good, not, not a very useful test. So we stopped doing this for them. The uh, molecular mimicry has been postulated between B27 and um, Klebsiella pneumonia, which may initiate the process. So management challenges. So it's important to understand the emergency room management before you get to the OR. So these are patients who essentially have back pain and unless proven otherwise, anybody with ankylosing spondylitis with a recent history of a fall or an injury, um, it, it, it behooves you to, to, to demonstrate that they don't have a fracture. So it's easy to miss it on x-rays. It's definitely easy to miss it on CT scan, even if it's a, um, um, a, a um, high, high resolution. So the gold standard is an MRI at the time um, if you're not sure if there's a fracture at all. But more importantly, have a heightened suspicion for an occult fracture. The challenges here with radiographs is that they have sclerosis. They have abundant syndesmal fights. So x-rays are not, not really you know, useful. Non-contiguous injuries are about 6 to 8%. So it's important to image the whole spine when in doubt. Be aware of um, um, C1, C2 subluxation. Immobilization, uh, immobilization techniques are important. Um, you have to have a caution with using the spine board because the most common thing that people get, um, especially if you have an injury, is, is it be laid flat and, um, and, and with their head extended or they put a cervical collar on. The problem with these patients is if you, let me show you a picture here. If you, if you have somebody like this on the left, you don't want to extend their neck, right? Um, this is how it's important. This is why it's important to make sure that you understand if somebody comes in like this, um, support them with head and, um, uh, and then, you know, the head, head and shoulders with, with pillows or supports and, and educate the people around you in the emergency room that these are patients who cannot be extended and have to be supported in, uh, inside you in their natural state. Anyway, so these are, these are patients are at risk for epidural hematoma and always have an uh, index of suspicion for that. These patients also have trouble with their airways and they can get spontaneous pneumothoraces. Uh, and they have reduced uh, total lung capacity, vital capacity, low force vital capacity. And, uh, and, and so pulmonary issues can be a problem. Again, we went through this before, so it's important to immobilize their natural state. So operative challenges. In the preoperative state, we talked a little bit about that. So airway is an issue. So communication with your, with your OR team, with the anesthesiologist is key. Um, and then, uh, you know, imaging is, is essential. Um, anesthesia, uh, make sure that, you know, you, you ruled out C1, C2 instability and when in doubt, you know, um, obviously leave, it, leave them in a collar um, and then image them. And then during surgery, um, difficulties with positioning, and we'll go over that, ventilation, bleeding, and hydrogenic fractures. Postoperatively, uh, the summary is that you can get epidural hematoma, so you always have high index of suspicion, especially if you've created a cavity, if you've done a decompression, you can, you can develop a hematoma. Even without a decompression, you can get a hematoma in the acute setting. And then in the, in the delayed setting, uh, these patients are at risk for um, um, issues in the, in the rehab as well as mobilization. So intraoperative challenges, why do they get them? So if you don't position them properly, uh, for example, if, you're, if there's too much pressure on the abdomen as you put them on the, on the Jackson 4 post, um, you can have a reduced IVC flow, which increases your azygous venous system, and that constantly increases bleeding. Now, if you have um, um, inadequate or inappropriately positioned uh, patient, um, you can have increased into intrathoracic pressure, into intra-abdominal pressure, and that um, changes your, your pulmonary mechanics, and that can cause difficulty with ventilation and pressures. Also, as discussed before, these patients are at risk for bleeding because of the um, infiltration and the neovascularization. Uh, so please be aware of this. And if you're doing an open case, um, you, you know, it's important to think about things like cell saver, trinexamic acid, to make sure you reduce your risk of blood loss. Now, differential diagnosis, we've already talked about it. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's important to differentiate DISH. In the early stages, it's kind of difficult, uh, but in the late stages, you can see, um, uh, you can see differences that are obvious. Um, the SI joint is one of the exam questions we often get asked here is, uh, you know, if there's one x-ray you can get to differentiate angst bond from DISH, what would that x-ray be? And that's the that's a, a x-ray of your SI joint to show fusion. Um, in the late stages, uh, the way to differentiate that is if you have involvement of the disc space, then it's usually angst bond DISH usually preserves that. 
So the natural course or history is that uh, it typically starts in your 20 to 30s and there's a gradual you know, increase. Patients early have pain um, and stiffness. Uh, typically the, the, the pain and stiffness, oh, sorry, pain improves once you get completely ankylosed. Um, and of course you get deformity at, the, at that time and you can get the chin on chest deformity. Um, and, uh, but we don't really know exactly why the ankylosis happens. So post fracture challenges. So the, the pattern of fracture, these are unstable and we'll, I have a nice slide to show you about the lever arm. Um, this acts like a long bone. Um, and, and so these are patients who are at risk for um, significant instability depending on where they are. Um, additional osteoporosis because of the fact that they, are, they have neovascularization makes, um, um, makes fracture fixation difficult. So if you're thinking short, go long. If you're thinking anterior, go anterior and posterior or posterior. So it's important to think about um, these patients as a separate entity because they are, um, they are a different animal compared to the average sarcolumbar fractures that you would see. Neurological complications are high, um, higher with uh, cervical followed by thoracic and uh, with, which kind of makes sense. Um, and nursing can be difficult because you know, often patients are in chin and chest deformity um, and that can be, make it difficult for, for nursing and, and pulmonary toilet as we talked about earlier. So this is the, the slide I wanted to show you in terms of lever arm. Um, so because, they're, because they have long ankylos segments, um, if you have a fracture right, for example, here, um, the whole thing wants to fall in front or behind and that can cause you know, difficulty. So uh, that's why it's important to make sure that you account for this lever arm and go along with your fixation um, and short fixation should not be, um, should not be in, your, in, your, in your mind at all for, for patients with ankylos and spondylitis. And so when I say short fixation, um, there, are, there, there are people who do one level above, one level below. Uh, these are not patients who, who, who would benefit from that, especially if you're only doing posterior. So let's go through some of the evidence. Um, this is a nice study that came out of um, uh, uh, JOT. Um, they did a systematic review. Um, these were ground level falls. Um, in, in this uh, re review, diagnosis was delayed. And, and this makes sense because people, you know, people easily miss injuries for 15 to 40% of the cases. Hyperextension was the most common and uh, cervical is more common than, than, than thoracic lumbar fractures with the highest propensity between C5 and C7. Deficits happen in 20 to 100% of the patients. Um, fixation operative was done about 40 to 100% and there are reasons why we don't want to, uh, we may not want to uh, do surgery and we'll talk about those as well. The mortality is, this is staggering, in one year post-injury, zero to 32%, which is a significant amount of mortality risks. Complications, uh, almost 80% of the patients got it either, and a lot of them was related to uh, uh, pulmonary uh, issues as, we, uh, as we've just discussed. And of course, pseudoarthrosis uh, because of lack of union. It's not that common to see pseudoarthrosis, especially if you fix them because these are patients who want to lay down bone, um, but you still have to keep that in mind. It's, uh, it's definitely possible. Um, but if you have a good uh, opposition with the, fracture, um, with the fractures, then usually they, they lay down bone well, especially if you're only going posterior without the need to go anterior. In this uh, retrospective review, the neurological deterioration happened about 15 to 16% of the patients. Fusion was successful in almost 100% of patients. And the deficits improved um, uh, in about 6 to 66% in final follow-up. So this is also a retrospective review where they looked at um, um, the surgical outcomes of posterior and combined approaches. But this is cervical fractures. Um, this is a retrospective review. It was a single institution from 1999 to 2015. These are patients who underwent posterior or combined. And they looked at demographics, radiographic results, perioperative complications and postoperative results. So the, post, the posterior only group, the mean operative time was 160 minutes. The estimated blood loss was, was approximately 300. The combined group of which the, they were staged and 90% of them were staged uh, and the posterior was the, was the first one to be staged. Estimated blood loss was higher, but the difference was not significant. The complications postoperatively was higher in the combined group, but was not, in the, at least in this uh, uh, review, not significant for them. The combined had a higher rate of neurological improvement, but again, this difference was not significant in this uh, in the study. So they, they concluded that both posterior and combined had good clinical results, but of course, as one would expect, uh, posterior alone had lower blood loss, lower complication rate, and shorter hospital stay combined uh, um, in comparison to combined. And none of these differences were, of course, uh, these in their study statistically significant. So th this, is a, uh, this is a study to illustrate why x-rays are not really standard of care. Um, you know, you can easily miss, um, even if it's a thin slice CT, 
Um, in this study, they only looked at CT versus X-ray, and we'll get to some MRI data. Um, CT was definitely better than X-rays, um, and uh, uh, and they concluded that MR was better in terms of sensitivities. This is a again a study where they looked at um, the clinical outcomes after traumatic spinal fractures in, in those with uh, ankylosing spondylitis with uh, with imaging. Um, here, 17% of the cases, um, the spine fracture was not found within 24 hours of injury with x-rays, which again goes back to tell us why you know, we shouldn't be just using or relying on x-rays. 52% of the delay was part of the treating physician, whereas 47% of the patient didn't report the injury. This study, um, they looked at MRI in fractures with ankylosing spondylitis, um, and uh, um, you know, this was uh, in about 60% of the cases, they recommended the use of adjuvant CT um, in, in, in this patient's MRI detected two fractures that were missed on CT. This was a retrospective review. Um, and they, the question here was, was whether routine use of MRI was necessary. In this, in this review, 3.2% of the patients uh, on CT required a change in treatment based on MRI findings. Only one was missed on CT but all the other missed injuries were disco ligamentous injury. So in this study, they concluded that routine use of MRI be limited to non-ankylose levels in which disco ligamentous injuries and neurological deficits were higher. I think we've kind of beat, beat this point to death. So let me just keep moving on here for, for sake of time and for questions. Um, I think we've kind of talked about this a little bit. So I'm just gonna move on here to the next um, so management options. So in terms of management options, you have both non-surgical and surgical in any part of orthopedics or, or spine. Um, non-surgical management is generally not the preferred way of treating. Uh, partly it's because um, we wanna make sure that um, we recognize and respect the fact that these are patients who are at risk of displacement um, and highly unstable and risk of delayed neurological injury. But it's, it may not be an option for everybody. So if they're, they're medically poor patients uh, and, and not able to take surgery, um, you, you may not want to uh, treat them. Uh, secondary fracture displacement and difficulty wearing a brace um, is mostly the reason why you, you have failures. We, at least in our institution, we use a rigid TLSO. Um, we don't use any, uh, uh, any flexible TLSOs uh, which are available uh, because again, for the obvious reason, these are highly unstable injuries. So this is a patient I treated um, without surgery. And as you can see here, there is a fracture that you can see but there was no extension, there's very, very little extension, but there's no extension into the posterior element. So this is one that I treated um, non-surgically. The patient did well without any delayed uh, deficits or pain. So again, this is a study to illustrate that. So surgical indication, generally, this is the preferred uh, method. Um, things to take into account are instability, osteoporosis, and complication rate. Um, the fracture displacement, is an indication if you have progressive neurological deficit is an indication. Epidural hematoma with deficits is an indication. Some patients have small epidural hematomas. And if you're not treating them surgically, you've got to watch them very closely. Um, and if you are treating them surgically, you've got to take that into account and do an additional decompression. I usually leave a drain in after I decompress just so uh, in, it reduces that risk, but it doesn't obviate that risk. Severe deformity that could complicate pulmonary rehab and then uh, recurrent fracture or, or symptomatic pseudoarthrosis. So in general, the options are you can either uh, treat them without surgery, you can either go anterior, you can go posterior, where, where you have two options, open versus perk, and then you do combined fixation. Here in this study, they looked at spine fractures in patients with ankylosing spondylitis, and they, they, this was actually a review article from uh, the, uh, the Yellow Journal. Um, here they suggested to go, you know, because the lever arm suggests at least uh, three above and three below um, in, in terms of your fixation. And uh, of course, technically the challenges are you don't, if you're doing an open case, um, especially if you don't have any additional imaging, um, it can be difficult to locate landmarks for, for, for getting your pedicle screws. Um, severely distorted facet joint makes it hard, it, depending on the size of the patient, that can be difficult. And of course, deformity makes it challenging as well, especially if you're going into the high thoracic levels where you know, the patients are, are really uh, bent over, it makes it that much difficult to get x-rays in. Um, um, and to take well, proper x-rays and, uh, um, and to make it safe. So anterior, posterior versus combined, I generally avoid anterior because of high morbidity and complication. Um, rarely 
you need anterior. But again, having said that, it's different in the thoracolumbar area compared, compared to cervical fractures. In cervical fractures, I'm much more likely to go anterior and posterior than, than in, in thoracolumbar fractures. Um, a large anterior gap, um, it may benefit from, from secondary anterior column reconstruction, but that's, that's based on my gestalt. I mean, there's no way to, there's no, it's difficult for me to give you a, a, an exact answer as to how much is, is large. Um, and you have, to, um, you have to go by a case by case. Here in this study, they looked at percutaneous fixation and the, they reviewed about 10 cases, not, not very many. Um, it's amazing they got published. Anyway, uh, percutaneous posterior fixation was a, was a good functional, you know, had good functional outcomes with low complications um, with, with surgery. So the current indications for MIS uh, in thoracolumbar fracture, and it, you can generalize this to angst as well, um, is restoration of the posterior tension mantle. This is the rationale. And you indirectly augment the anterior column uh, if, you're, if you're supplementing it. Um, and, and, and of course, uh, uh, as a substitution when indirect or direct uh, fixation is not feasible. So again, we've talked about this before. Be aware of uh, epidural hematomas. Um, fractures above and below fixations uh, can cause uh, mobile segments. So it's important to keep, you know, take into account and make sure you, you image the whole spine. Uh, and that you don't stop short of a, of a mobile segment. And then pseudoarthrosis, loss of fixation, and a secondary neurological abnormality. In terms of loss of fixation, one of my um, go-to is uh, additionally augmenting screws with cement. So if I'm concerned at all, if the patient has significant osteoporosis, or even with the age factor where we, can't, uh, we don't have the, the luxury of getting a bone density before surgery in a, in a, uh, in a uh, trauma case, then I would uh, I have a very low threshold to uh, augmenting their screws with cement. There are certain fenestrated screws you have, um, so you don't have to additionally, um, so it makes it a little bit easier in the OR. So these are my take home messages. So let me just go through this here. Always have a high index of suspicion for patients with ankylosing spondylitis. So I tell my residents anytime, the, anytime they see somebody who has a appearance of ankylosing spondylitis or DISH um, on the x-ray or on a CT scan, um, you have to absolutely make sure they don't have any um, occult fractures. If they have back pain, you've got to make sure that you get at least a, a CT, but if CT is negative, move on to an MRI. Take them seriously. Uh, these fractures are highly unstable, the significant risk of mortality. X-rays are not reliable as we discussed. Im uh, and you have to immobilize them in their natural state as opposed to extending them. Uh, and education is the key right, uh, you know, here. And in our emergency room department, um, you know, we, have, we have pictures, we, we, also have, uh, um, we also have posters to, to say watch for these patients. Um, and to make sure that they, they're treated uh, in their natural state. Persistent pain may be the only symptom and a lot of patients actually come in just with that um, and they can develop late neurological compromise and, and be aware of post-surgical or traumatic epidural hematomas and take that into account as part of your surgical management planning. Pseudoarthrosis can be a frequent complication. And, um, and so, so if you think these two are the same, again, you know, please look again. That was the end of my talk. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Venkat, for that fantastic presentation. And uh, you showed a really fantastic case as well. A few questions that have come up. See, whenever a fracture occurs in ankylosing spondylitis, is it the cervical spine that is more commonly involved or is the thoracic or the lumbar? Typically, cervical more commonly than thoracic, which is more common than lumbar. Because I mean, it's, it's not common to see ankylosing segments in the, the lumbar region. It's possible, but it's much more common in the cervical and thoracic regions. And it's in the more on the lower cervical spine, isn't it? Right, right. I mean, you, you know, typically, you know, at least in thoracic lumbar fractures, um, in, in non ankylosed patients, we, you know, we say T12L1 is usually where the, the hypermobile segment uh, in the lumbar spine meets the, the relatively immobile segment in the thoracic spine, but it's not the same in the cervical spine. Then you would expect most more injuries to happen at C7, T1, which is not really the common location. It's more C5, C6. So we don't really know why that is, um, but, but that's one of the theories. Is, uh, but of course, if you have an ankylo segment, all bets are off and, and they are potentially unstable. So they, you know, it doesn't take much to, to break them. And these fractures typically occurs through the disc space, isn't it? Right, so, so we do, yes, right. So, I mean, I, I don't know if it's, it's more through the disc space. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but but it's no different than going to the vertebral body because their their disc space is also uh, ankylosed. So um, I, I'm not aware of any 
study that looked at whether one is more uh, prominent than others, um, but you should treat them no differently. There are situations where if the disc space is intact and the fracture um, occurs through the disco ligament is complex, those are injuries you wanna take seriously because if you had the same thing as a chance fracture, those can be treated without the need for surgery in some circum, you know, in certain, I mean, based on the circumstances. But if you have a pure disco ligamentous injury, they're, they're, they're harder to, to heal because, uh, you know, it's not like bone, there's no opposition and it takes longer to heal. So those are patients you wanna, you know, watch longer and to, to be vigilant. And when it occurs in the cervical spine, these fractures, do you think that the deformity wouldn't be there, isn't it? Because they're going to have the fracture in you know, the pre-existing deformity. Right, so I, sorry, I, please help me repeat that question again. I wanna make sure I, I didn't quite hear. Yeah, so when these fractures occur in the cervical spine, the uh -huh. patient wouldn't have the classic deformities, isn't it? Like what you showed in the picture. Right, yeah, you don't necessarily, because of the lordosis, um, all you can see, and we recently had a case where it was it was reported as a anterior osteophyte fracture, but that's really all you'll see is just a break in the uh, anterior, um, and then the extra, the, the CT didn't show anything else. Um, interesting, when we got the MRI, you could see the, the, the T1 and T2 changes where the, the fracture went through the, uh, through the, the fractures of the uh, anterior osteophyte went right through the disc, uh, exited the posterior longitudinal ligament uh, with, a, with a disruption, exited further posteriorly, disrupting the uh, ligament of flavum. But the interesting part was because of lordosis, he, were, he was extended anteriorly. Um, so you, you didn't see the obvious deformity on, uh, on the CT scan. Um, but there are patients who have a, a flexion deformity and then it becomes more prominent. It becomes, if you have an intact lordosis, it's easy to miss it. But once you have a kyphal spine in the cervical spine, um, the deformity gets exaggerated for the same reason we just talked, it's just the opposite. So you mean to say if you have a fracture, if, if the patient has a chin on chest or a stooping forward deformity before and he has a fracture, do you think it's going to go back, it's going to extend or it's going to be flexion? Right, if, if, they're, if they're in cervical kyphosis and it's fixed, usually it gets worse with, with flexion because usually these are flexion injuries uh, because of the moment that, that you know, um, uh, or, or, or the, uh, the long lever arm in the moment um, on the fracture. If you, if you have intact lordosis, they typically tend to fall backwards. But I've seen both, you know, it, 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 that's where it becomes unstable. And the longer the segment, it, you know, it makes that, you know, makes it that much more difficult. But yeah, you, depending on the natural state, whether you have existing lordosis or kyphosis, usually that deformity gets exaggerated. And uh, can we do a simultaneous osteotomy when these fractures, while correcting these fractures? It's a great question. Yes. So there are situations in which um, the, there's, I, I've had three or four cases where, um, you know, in, in talking to the patient, they've had significant deformity. Um, you know, my preference is not to do those deform, the, the osteotomies early. Yeah. No, but you can use, use it to your advantage, as I discussed earlier, uh, the way you're positioning patients and to improve their, um, their, uh, their difficulty looking at the horizon because of how, how, how bent they are. But you can't extrapolate that to every case. The reason for that is your best bet in terms of getting a deformity correction, especially in the cervical thoracic region, is by doing a pedicle subtraction osteotomy at C7. Um, that you can't achieve it in every case. And it's not common to have a fracture in that same place. The other thing is when you try to improve the uh, deformities, when you end up getting um, additional neurological injury um, because there's additional hematoma there. But if you do it in a controlled environment in a delayed fashion, it's, it's a bit better. So, but you can, but you have to, you have to uh, individualize, individualize it based on the situation. I hope that um, answers the question. I know it's yeah. a bit circuitous, but. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very true, like what you said, it should be on a purely case-by-case -case basis. Right. All the fractures are not the same and we need to use our principles, isn't it? Right, right, exactly. Uh, thank you for that. The other question is, do you use neuromonitoring for all your patients? Great question. So um, the, the cases that I do, which are mostly deformity, um, I do neuromonitoring. I think that's where um, there's less controversy. Um, I do based on the regional, and I'll make it as a general statement in my, well, I'll give you my, my practice and I'll give you a general statement. My practice, um, the only time I don't use uh, neuromonitoring is laminectomies and discectomies. Uh, anytime I instrument, I, uh, or if I'm correcting a deformity, I always use neuromonitoring, especially in trauma cases uh, or elective cases that involve deformity. Um, the general statement I'm gonna make is that there's no evidence to support any of this except in deformity. 
um, especially for the trainees and, and for the fellows. The, um, the, uh, there's a lot of controversy in terms of neuromonitoring, uh, but one that's less controversial or not controversial is use, use in deformity surgery. The, uh, the reason why I don't use it in uh, laminectomies and discectomies is, is, is purely because I can, you know, I don't, we don't use any chemical relaxation so I can see the direct feedback um, of the nerves if I'm close to it. Um, and most of my cases there are uh, through tubes anyway, so I can actually visualize everything through the tube with the microscope. Um, so, so that's my preference is I only use neuromonitoring for, for uh, cases other than those. Uh, the other question is uh, regarding the O arm. So, uh -huh. do you, is it uh, very similar to an intraoperative CT, or do you think just uh, an O arm is enough? Right. So, the, it is an intraoperative CT scan, but it's it's a lot less radiation compared to what you would normally expect to see in terms of sending a patient through a regular CT with radiology. Um, so, the less radiation and, and the cumulative amount of X-ray radiation you would get from from other cases not using navigation, it's a lot higher. So at the end of the day, um, after you've finished using an ORM, the patient and the staff get much less radiation compared to when using. And again, I, you know, ORM is only one aspect of it. There's multiple different companies that offer, almost every company now has its own version of navigation. So I think navigation is a much more gen generic statement than specifically saying ORM. So I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I put it on that slide, but uh, I'd like to clarify that it's only one platform for navigation. And it's, it's, it's completely changed my practice. And is it possible, I mean, you couple navigation with OAM, isn't it? I'm sorry, I missed that question. You, you always do couple, I mean, join the navigation with the OAM. And oh, is so it possible the, to do it separately? I mean, just identify your bony uh, landmarks using your probes and uh -huh. not use the OAM? So the ORM, so the ORM, so it, it, it comes as the packet. So I mean, you, there are, you can use the ORM to just get a CT scan. So for example, let's say you have, you, you put a screw in or you put some screws in, you do a T lift or whatever, in any case, you can bring the ORM in and take a CT scan. If you have any question about the screws, you're saying, well, I'm not sure the x-rays are accurate. Um, so I want to get an intraoperative CT scan. You can use that. But for the sake of um, navigating your screws and any equipment uh, and for the implants, you do need the O-arm, you do need the stealth, which is the camera that, that triangulates with the O-arm, which triangulates with your instruments. So that's real time. It's almost like playing a video game. You can actually see the screw going, you can see the tap going, you can see all your instruments going. There are limitations, of course. And, and you know, when I first started my, my early part of my career, you know, I was this close to abandoning navigation because um, what I thought based on my intraoperative cues um, was different than what the O-arm was telling me. You know, when in doubt, you always have to revert back to your basics, your 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 gut feeling, and your anatomy because that's what's going to save you at the end of the day. Because it's very easy for someone to put a screw into the canal uh, or near the nerve root if you're not paying attention. Because the OR will tell you, based on where your hand is, they'll tell you that you're going in the right track, but you're not. Um, you know, fascia, skin incision, everything will, will be in your way. They're all your enemies. You know, you have to make sure you, know, you take that into account and, and make your proper incision so that the fascia is not. So I tell my residents, you know, you have to use light hands. This is not one of those things where you, you have to hold something rigid and then, and then keep pushing. If you're that rigid, you could put it in an area um, and the OM will tell you you're great, but it's not, you know, if you take an x-ray, you'll be out. And that's why the traditional saying that if you put in garbage, you may get out garbage, isn't it? <laughs> that is absolutely correct. That is absolutely correct. Okay, thank you. I think, Venkit, that's all the questions that we have. Thank you for this fantastic session. A lot of new insight and cutting edge work and really glad to see the kind of work you're doing at Tucson. And we really look forward for another lecture whenever you have, have time later on. Thank you, Hitesh. That's, that's great. Thanks for having me and, uh, and a great job and uh, work on the initiative uh, um, you know, across the world. Anyway, thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Goodbye.